that song that we just sang, I have to tell you, I've just in my mind been singing that one again and again and again, Be Still My Soul, because that's what, uh, you want that to be true all the time, but you know, when you have kind of back-to-back-to-back things like this happen, it, it can kind of unsettle you, and you just want to, by, by appealing to the Scripture, by finding your rest and hope and peace and assurance in Scripture, that's how you can kind of allow the, the ups and downs circumstances of life. Instead, you can just be stable through those times. Uh, look with me, if you would, over, th- this is not going to be our message this morning, but look with me to the book of Psalms, a passage that, um, that I've often thought about in relationship to, to these types of th- things. Look over to Psalms 42, and that song that we just sang, one of, my, one of my favorite phrases in that song is when it says, Be still, my soul, the waves and wind still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. You know what that's talking about? Remember when the Lord Jesus Christ sent the apostles out on the sea and this great, great storm arose and they certainly thought, and by all appearances, it looked like they were going to perish. They they said that. And it said about the Lord Jesus Christ, he was not only with them on the ship, but he was asleep. Okay, now wait a minute. (laughs) How do you sleep? When you're on a little small ship and it's in the midst of a torrential storm, how do you sleep? Well, that conveys the nature of the peace that ruled in his heart, how he just found his total peace and rest in the Word of God. And in fact, it says he was asleep on a pillow, okay? And that doesn't mean like the Mike Lindell type of pillow kind of thing, okay? <laughs> but his, the place where he laid his head was the pillow of Scripture, the Word of God, and that's how he was able to sleep. And of course, they come to him, and they're quite terrified. Save us, Lord, help, we perish, you know? And he stands up, peace, be still. And instantly there was a calm. The very power that came out of his mouth was the power that created everything out of nothing. And the waves and the wind remembered that voice from many, many years prior to that when he brought them into existence. And they still to this day remember his voice. And so when we study the scripture, when we look in the scripture, this is the voice of God. This is, this is his word. We let his word get into our soul to bring about that same peace, be still, even in the midst of trouble, trouble, trouble at times. There's a couple of wonderful passages. Look at Psalms 42. David here is, is going through a, a very, very rough time, as it were. Psalms 42, he says, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. Imagine the soul being thirsty for God. Have, as you, have you ever found your physical body just thirsty? You're almost dehydrated. You've got to get some. Well, that's the condition of his soul here. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I appear, come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night. He's obviously very discouraged while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? See, they're mocking him. He's going through a great affliction in his life, and they're just mocking him. Where is thy God? Your God's abandoned you if he ever existed at all. And he certainly, all external appearances, kind of lends credence to that suggestion. And so he's in great tears because externally it looks like it. He knows God has not abandoned him. But you, can, you know the emotional ups and downs that you can go when you, and, and experience. And, He says this, I'm going to jump ahead, verse 5. Look at this question he asks. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? By the way, stop right there. What's the answer to those questions? Have you ever experienced your soul being cast down? Your soul being disquieted? When, When he asks those questions, what's the answer to those questions? I'm thinking about the wrong thing. I'm focusing on the wrong thing. That's why it's cast down. And he knows that. But he says here, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And you can, boy, <laughs> why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. His countenance is his presence. See, he knew the answer. And don't we know the answer as well, that if we find ourselves maybe down and discouraged, whatever it might be going through, 
Just talk to God and allow his word to be the answer. Hope thou in God. Find your comfort, your assurance, your peace in God. He is our strength. He is our hope. He is our all in all. So passages like that, he actually says it again. Look at verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. And he asks it again a third time in verse 5 of the next chapter, 43, 5. He says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. See the repeated. He knows the answer. It's very clear. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. So wonderful verses to think about. Before we get to our message today, and thank you again, Rich, for the update. Thank you, everyone that has been there so much for Debbie and, and uh, her. She has she expressed to myself and Lori the other day that uh, just, the, and, and even in her text message, she said, boy, the, the support of the local assembly has been just amazing. Denise Loyato has really conveyed the same thing as well with her, with Joseph now in the presence of the Lord. She, she's aware of that, they rejoice in that. And she understands that you still got to move forward by faith in God's word and allow God's word to be her strength. And that is what she's doing as well. So I wanted to mention a couple of things before we actually get into our study. Um, I, I know I can say this for, for not just for myself, but on behalf of my wife and I think everybody else here. None of us knows when we're going to go home to be with the Lord. But can I uh, beseech everyone here, please take care of yourself. Okay. Um, right, James? Right? <laughs> everybody, everybody, you know, please take care of yourself. Um, we're, uh, as much as we all want to go home to be with the Lord, and we want you to go, and you will, when you depart this life, you're going to go be with the Lord. We're still a small local assembly. We're not, <laughs> we want to grow the assembly, okay? But to do take care of yourself, and, and do be aware of, of your, your health, uh, and, of course, if you're married, uh, for your spouse, for your husband, make sure and, and pay attention to those things. It's not an all, at all a sign of unbelief. If you uh, be aware of your health, things like that, you, you are, the Apostle Paul says that we're supposed to provide for those, and especially those of our own household. And so, especially uh, guys, men here today, there is a spiritual responsibility that we have towards those members of our family. We are to be the leaders in all aspects of that. But ladies also, uh, please take care of your health. It's something you want to be aware of. And don't be afraid, don't be scared. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but just, uh, just uh, be aware of your health. And if it, if it uh, would necessitate changes in terms of health, things like that, uh, diet, exercise, whatever. I know Ken's allergic to exercise but not so much to diet. But anyway, uh, do, do take care of that. Um, also, uh, Barry, go ahead, sir. Just about finances, to make sure you're on the same page, because if one goes, then they know what's going on. Very important what uh, Barry said, especially for you couples here today, but really everybody. Uh, take care of your finances. Make sure that uh, each of you, husband and wife, that you are aware of the financial situation. You don't want to leave someone unprepared as it were, not knowing what the next step is or how to get to the next step, please take care of those things, discuss those things, talk about those things, because they're important. Um, if, you know, your husbands and wife, that, that's your best friend, that's your soulmate, and, and give all out to them, 100%, hold nothing back. Especially husbands. Scriptures make it very, very clear. Husbands, love your wife, says Christ loved the church. It's real interesting that nowhere in Paul's epistles does it say, wives, love your husbands. Now, it does, now he does tell the wives, the older women, to teach the younger women to love their husbands. Because sometimes the husbands are not so lovable, by the way, right, guys? We know that, okay? But he very clearly says, husbands, love your wives in all aspects and every way. We are to take that lead. And that involves not just emotionally, physically, but, but even financially, all those aspects to, to keep those things important and on the table. By the way, I, I'm also, I, I forgot to mention, uh, Jonathan is here today. Great to see you, by the way. Uh, you kind of have an important <laughs> announcement, right? Uh, I'm, I'm totally putting him on the spot. He had no idea I was going to do this. But you kind of have an important announcement, maybe? What, I do have an announcement. You can stand up. Tell us what, what the announcement is here. 
to be here this morning. I'm Face everybody so I can hear you. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's that? That's right, that's one way to grow. And you guys are helping too, by the way, everybody here, right? <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. She's about how far along? You guys are about how far along now? Nine weeks. About nine weeks. That's pretty exciting. She's really battling that, the, the nausea in it big time, really. So you, you moms here can relate to all that. So maybe kind of reach out to her and everything. Before we get to our lesson this morning, um, and we're going to be back over in Ephesians here in just a moment, but I want to just take a few minutes as, as, as a family here today, a local assembly, not just believers, but family, members of the household of God. And when you face things like, like this, this is, not, this is not unusual. People pass on to be with the Lord all the time. Paul the Apostle Paul says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. So we face things like unsaved people face because we're humanity, okay? But what I'd like to do just for the next couple of moments, just to see if anybody has questions that you feel like you'd like, like to bring up now about any of this. Joseph's departing, how to deal with something like that. Uh, Tom's situation, how to deal with that. Does anybody have a question or a thought or a concern? Uh, that uh, we, you feel like as a family that would be helpful for us to maybe talk about, think about, discuss it all? Anybody? If, if not, uh, or if you do, but maybe you don't want to bring it up publicly, that's fine too. Just you can approach myself or some of the others afterwards. Um, but uh, being, being a, a tight knit, as they say, local assembly family and so forth, we really, we do impact each other. That's a fact. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Amen. Everybody, everybody get the sense of what he said there. And for the folks listening on the internet, what uh, Rich basically said is that, um, you know, we, the emotions can go up and down. And wherever you find yourself, appeal to scripture and don't hesitate also to reach out to someone else and just ask them, how are you doing? And uh, it's funny, we were talking earlier um, about how what the guys, what guys tend to do mostly, we tend to internalize everything, right? You know, because we got to be the tough, strong guy and everything. And, you know, wear our cowboy hat and I got my boots on anyway. <laughs> you know, so we got to be the tough guy. So we tend to internalize everything. But then what that does, that, well, you know what that does, guys, right? <laughs> okay. And so, by the way, and that's okay. It's okay. We want to find our strength, not in ourselves, but in the Lord. That's what we want to do. And so whatever, whatever happens like this to find our peace in God's word and strengthen the Lord, Barry, and then Tom, go ahead, Barry. I just want to say that when you're sitting there and people are going through it, understand you've got to show them grace, but sometimes the emotion, especially in the family, there could be you know, some troublesome things, everybody's not getting along or doing that. You've got to help that situation. Yes. You've got to protect the vulnerable. You've yes. You've got to do it out of grace. You've got to sometimes keep people separate. You, you, you have to look at that and understand that people aren't dealing with things and this is a lot of pressure for people and sometimes relationships aren't what you think it is or the perfect family or nobody has. That's exactly right. You have to take that with grace but you also have to step in and, and do things that you know make sure you keep the peace. Yep. Everyone handles grief and suffering and affliction differently. And sometimes what one person might react way extreme to one way, sometimes the other person will act the other way, and then afterwards they go back and say, you know, I, I didn't mean to react that way. But you know what, at times of affliction and suffering, people will react differently. So you want to help people through those times, exactly like you're saying, to protect people, things like that. Um, uh, Tom, you had an observation or a comment.
Yes. Yep. Yes, yeah. Um, Thank you for bringing that up. They're no doubt listening online right now. And, and again, for those that uh, maybe on the internet couldn't hear that, Steve and Anne appears that she had a little bit of a mini stroke. She's back home now, you, you pray for them. She's had kind of a rough health situation really the last several years been kind of rough. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, both of them just dear, dear, dear saints and so forth. James, go ahead, sir. Yes. Correct. That is correct. So what are we really saying? You know that. I mean, that Isn't that a great question? That's an amazing question right there. The question is, let me repeat it for the folks on the internet. There it is that when situations like this happen, and you pray, or someone says, "Would you pray?" In the light of the dispensation of grace, in the light of where we live historically, in the light of what God is and is not doing, how do we pray? What do we pray for? That's a marvelous question. Let's look at some verses. Let's spend some time on this. This is important, okay? Um, it's all important. So, so let's begin here. Look, look over to Romans in chapter number 8. Get, get two passages, get Romans 8 and then get, get Philippians 4. Get Romans 8 and get Philippians in chapter number 4. The question is, what in situations like this, and really in all situations in life, what do we pray for? What, what do we, how do we pray for? What is our request for the person going through the affliction, the difficulty? First of all, notice this in Philippians 4, and, and then we're going to get to Romans 8. Look at Philippians 4. Philippians 4, it, it, it says, I'm going to start at verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. So before we go to the next couple of verses, some key things to appreciate here. Where are we to find our joy? Where are we to find our hope, our confidence, our assurance? It's all in the Lord. Now, in much of the world and in much of Christianity, sad to say, but where is it they, they're leading us to expect to find our assurance, our joy, our... What's that? Yeah, it, circumstances, right? This passage makes it very clear. Re, find our joy in Christ. And then verse 5, let your moderation. What's the word moderation mean? Gentleness. Stability, like an even keel, not, not, not like the waves tossing on the sea. But So we're going through affliction. The only way to let our moderation be known, the only way to have an even keel when the waves are roaring, is there must be something in our soul that is stabilizing us. Amen. And what is in our soul stabilizing us is the scriptures, the word of God. So when he says, let your moderation be known to all men, when people look at you, they see you're not all freaking out and everything. By the way, when tragedy happens, that doesn't mean you can't bend over and weep and cry deeply. That's not what, when that verse says, let your moderation, that verse doesn't say, it doesn't mean that you can't show the depth of emotion of, the, of the, the passing of a loved one at all. But it means that the sound doctrine of scripture working in us is what stabilizes us when the seas of life are rough and you're going through hard time. 
He says, let your moderation be known unto all men. What's the next phrase say? The Lord is where? The Lord's where? What's that mean? He's right there. Why do we need to know that? What's that? We're never alone. You might feel like you're alone, but you're never alone. The Lord is at hand. And not only is he at hand, that means he is our resource. He is the one to find joy in. He is the one to rest in. He's at hand. He's right there. Isn't it amazing, Rich? Go ahead. So much more significant than having my guardian angels are. Yes. Wow. Everybody hear what he said? That's so much better than the whole concept of having a guardian angel, which you do not have a guardian angel. You don't. You've got God the Holy Spirit. The Lord is at hand. And then he says, be careful for nothing. The idea of care, careful is all anxious and full of care and worried and upset. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Okay, let me ask this question. Does the Apostle Paul instruct us to let our requests be made known unto God? Yes. Yes. See how clear that is? So I have a question. Is there any subject, as far as God is concerned, that is off limits to talk to him about? No. Isn't that interesting? That's wonderful to know that. You can talk to God about everything and anything. By the way, he, he knows what you're thinking anyway. You know? <laughs> you know? we, we were talking earlier today about, about on the way over here, I was kind of just talking to the Lord about something, and there's a particular subject that when the Lord ever brings it up, I say, Lord, no, no, I don't want to talk to you about that. The Lord says, all right. And say, Lord, I'm not ready to entertain that yet. And you guys all know what it's about. I'm never going to quit riding my dirt bikes. Anyway, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but uh, at any rate, uh, that, whatever. With that, so you, you talk to the Lord about everything. You let your requests be made known unto him. Right? Which book are we reading this in? Which book? This is Philippians. Is Philippians one of Paul's first epistles or one of the ones he wrote later in his ministry? And then when you think about the sequence of the book of Philippians, you've, you've gone through, you've gone through Romans, then you've gone through 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then you've gone through Galatians, then you went through Ephesians, and now you're in Philippians. So do you have a whole bunch of sound doctrine in your soul? So when he says, let your requests be made unto the Lord, he's not saying that as though this is the first time he's ever conveyed sound doctrine. In the light of all that sound doctrine, now talk to the Lord. So, now go over, but by the way, by the way, it says in verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your what? And what? Now, what part of you, what part of your being, you see hearts is plural there, and minds is plural, so he's talking technically about the local assembly, right? But what, what's that? That's right. See, the hearts and the minds, that's your part of your inner man, part of your non-material being. So it's clear from, from this verse, we let our requests made known to God. What can we reasonably and rightfully from this passage expect from God to do? For, let me ask it this way. Where, based on these verses, can we expect God to respond to our prayers? In our inner man. Comfort the inner man. Is his promise here about the outer man? No. It isn't, is it? Does God tell us anything about how we should think about the outer man? He does, doesn't he? Look over to Romans 8 and then 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Does God know that our outer man is perishing? Does God know that? Do we know that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> just yes, sir. you know. Why do we need to know that? Because we can't put hope in that. Therefore, is the healing program operational in the dispensation of grace? No. no. The healing promise, the healing program for the body of Christ, it's the rapture. 
that's when you're going to get a brand new glorified body. So if that's all true, and when I say if, I'm not, if in the sense of doubt, but if that's all true, then that, doesn't that lead us to how to pray, what to pray for, what to talk to God about in whatever the situation is? So the focus of our prayer request to God in whatever the situation is, doesn't it have primarily to do, therefore, with the inner man of the person? and the working of God's word in the inner man to bring about glory, as it were. Look at this passage here in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. I'm going to start at verse 15 here. It says, For all things are for your sakes, that is, for their benefit. Paul's ministry is for their benefit. Even though he's going through affliction and suffering, he kept pressing the ministry and the message because that was going to help them grow in, in, in grace and so forth. He says, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace, that is, that's the, the grace of God that's sufficient, right? That abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. See how the glory of God's the issue right there? For which cause? What's the cause? The glory of God. There's the cause. The thanksgiving redounding to the glory of God. That's the cause. He says, for which cause we faint not. So we don't give up. We don't quit. We don't let the circumstances, we don't focus on them because they'll overwhelm us. He says, but though our outward man does what? What does that mean? It perishes. What's that mean? Yeah, just falling apart. Okay. He says, yet the, you didn't have to say amen too loud, by the way. <laughs> okay. you know, but, but that's true. Yeah. He says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I got a question. Do you have an outward man? Yes. Do you have an inward man? Yes. How do you know? Tells us. Number one, the scripture tells you. Number two, is your outward man real? Yes. Your inward man is every bit as real as your outward man. It's just different. Your inward man is the non-material part of you. Your outward man is carbon-based. It's just the flesh and everything. But you've got an inward man. You've got your soul and your spirit that are eternal. And that verse says the inward man is renewed day by day. So think about that. Next time that we, we struggle with the, the reality that our bodies are breaking down over time, what's happening to the inward man? It's being built up over time. Wow. Knowing that, can't that change your perspective about the importance of Scripture getting into your soul? Isn't that something? He says... Look at verse 17, for our light affliction. It doesn't feel like it's light at the time, does it? It feels very heavy and burdensome. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And so too, it doesn't feel like it's but for a moment. It goes on and on and on. They say when you're out and you're having fun and you're excited and thrilled, having a good time, time goes so fast. But when you're sick at home, in a bed, alone. Those nights are long. You can't wait for the day to get up and walk around. And the day is so long, you can't wait to get back and go to bed. It seems like time just slows down when you're in affliction, doesn't it? When he, he, when he says there, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, relative to eternity is, but it is but a moment. He says, verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, what's the next phrase? It worketh for us. Does the affliction work for you or against you? Now, if your whole life, if you've been raised up and taught that whole health, wealth, prosperity nonsense, do you realize that is 100% opposite of what these verses just told us? It's exactly the opposite. That whole concept, health, wealth, prosperity, God wants you healthy and wealthy and wise. And when they say wise, they don't mean wise in the scripture sense of the word, just human viewpoint about all kinds of stuff. It's exactly the opposite of what the Apostle Paul teaches us how to view affliction and suffering. That verse says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? What's it say there? What was the end phrase at verse 15? What's the end phrase at verse 15? 
the glory of God. Isn't that the cause? Isn't that the purpose? So I have a question for you. In the midst of the affliction, can our response to that affliction actually wind up producing glory? Yes. Do you want that to be so? Yes. Therefore, glory. how should we view that affliction? As an opportunity. To, to do renewed. what? To be, to be renewed and thereby bring about what? I want to share a passage of scripture. Let me keep reading, and then I'm going to share a passage over in Romans chapter 5. Brother Jim, right there. See, Jim, wave your hand there. Okay. Years ago, right? He, he, he said, you know, that passage in Romans 5, I don't think we're looking at that verse right. And he, and he said, you know, and we'll get there in just a second. But, but stay there in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He says, for our light affliction is but for a moment. It worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look, not at the things which are seen, the temporary, the here, the now. Let's not focus on the sufferings, the affliction. So verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 4, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. What are some of the things that are not seen that you can see with the eye of faith. Soul. What's that? Your soul. Your soul. Good. What else? The glory, the glory in heaven. The reality of heavenly places. Yes. Righteousness, justification, eternal life, forgiveness of all your sins, your position in Christ. All these things that you can see with the eye of faith because Scripture tells you they're real. So we focus on those things, not on the things that are passing and perishing. Verse 18 says this, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are what? And they are, aren't they? Every passing day, it just reemphasizes that statement. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Now back to the verse, verse 17, when it says, it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Go to Romans 5. Go to Romans 5. So when we face whatever the affliction is, Passages like these, can, you, can, you, can we now see how they actually have equipped us to go through the affliction and actually have glory be the result? Do you see that? So, when affliction comes, yes, we sorrow, but not as those that have no hope. When affliction comes, yes, we cry out, ouch, it hurts, please, <laughs> no more. But we realize, okay, you know what? It's just the sufferings of this present time. We appeal to the Word of God. It's our strength. It's our, it's our, it's our hope. It's our assurance. It's our comfort. So now look at a verse like this. This is the passage that uh, Brother Jim brought up. Look at this, verse 3 now. So 5-3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Now, usually when we read that verse, we have thought about it. I've taught it in the sense that we rejoice in tribulation. We glory in tribulation. And that's a true statement. But that verse is way deeper than that. That verse is the complement to what we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 there. To glory in the tribulation is to walk by faith in the tribulation to let his word work in me. Therefore, it works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It does what that verse says. The way to glory in the tribulation is to walk by faith through it. Not expecting God to take it away, not by expecting God to heal me, not by expecting God to fix everything, but rather recognizing that the outer man perishes. That's a fact. I'll do all that I can to make sure it stays healthy as long as I can. That's the thing to do. Even the Apostle Paul counseled Timothy about his health. He says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. By the way, the key word is a little. Okay. <laughs> a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and then often infirmities. He had to leave Trophimus sick, he says. He, he, the healing campaign had gone away. He says, Trophimus have a left at my lead him sick. That had not only way heavy on Trophimus' heart, but Paul's heart as well. He was a close, dear friend of his. And when this passage says, we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hey, there's that worketh again. Patience, experience, and experience hope. And as you go through that affliction, you go through that suffering, you, you, and you appeal to the word of God, 
The love of God is shed abroad in our heart, it says, by reminding us about Calvary. The extent that the Godhead was willing to go to was the cross. The Godhead, they were all in. They held no chips back, as they say. Calvary proves the extent to which they were willing to go and that they did go. In the light of all that, you can go now over to Romans chapter number 8. Turn over to Romans chapter number 8. Look at this passage. Look at this passage at verse 18. Eight, uh, Romans 8, 18, he says this. For I reckon. What does the word reckon mean? Yes, an accounting word, as it were. Okay, you're, you're, you're adding everything up. You're multiplying, dividing, and look at all the final numbers, and, as it were. You're coming to the conclusion of what the numbers tell you, if you can think of it in an illustration, right? And here's what they tell us. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, stop right there. By the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, using that phrase, the sufferings of this present time, isn't he kind of telling us what it's going to be like? So the present nature of the dispensation of grace, by default, is a time of suffering. After all, God himself is long-suffering. That's interesting. He says there in that verse, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, so they're not going to go forever, right? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Is the glory real? Yes. Is the suffering real? Yes. Should you compare them? Yes. What's it say? <laughs> that verse says it's not even worthy to be compared. So what you do when you go, th whatever the sufferings and affliction are, if the affliction is the opportunity to let the word work to produce glory, then let's just say, this is going to be a silly way to say it, but let's say that, that the intensity of suffering that you're going through is a degree out of 1 to 100. Let's say it's 20. This is just a crazy illustration, okay? But then doesn't that demand that the glory that can be and is produced in that suffering is way off the chart? It's way, you can't even, it's way beyond 100, as it were. Is, is this making sense there? That's why he says it redounds to the glory of God. Every situation that we face when we go through affliction, hardship, uh, uh, trust the word, trust the scripture, rest in the scripture. That's what he's saying. The scripture works. It works in us when we believe. I'll get you in just a second. Okay, Garrett. We, we rest in the scripture when we believe it. So let's bring this full circle. In the light of all this, should we pray? Yes, yes or no? Without ceasing. Yes, yes. Should we talk to God about anything and everything? Yes, yes. Always. Should we pray when we talk to God about and in light of what passages like these teach us about realistic expectations in this life? Yes. Does that make sense? Realistic expectations about the outer man and the inner man. Doesn't it sound like the focus and emphasis of God's working is on the inner man and not the outer man? So when we pray for someone, we have to consciously, this is a battle. I, I've had situations before, Barry and Sarah can, Barry and Sarah can testify to this. I, we were at the bedside of a, a, a cousin, yes, a cousin of yours? Yes, yes. And, and everybody else in the room, except a couple, three of us, four, four of us, I think, Everyone else, they were Pentecostalists. They were expecting that guy to raise, raise up, as it were. There was another preacher there who was a Pentecostalist. Family up. And, and you know, that guy prays, and then, and then some, and I think you guys asked me to pray, and I thought, oh, great, here we go. <laughs> you know? And when I went there and prayed, I, I had to consciously take control of my mind. Because you're going into this room that they have all these expectations where I'm going to pray for the guy's healing. I'm going to pray of miracles. And I said, and I'm thinking, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm praying for this guy's soul and for the people here to hear the gospel of grace. And it was completely different than what they expected a pastor to pray, as it were. And you have to do that. You have to be 
willing to believe these verses and let these verses instruct us how to think about what's going on and therefore how to pray for those going through the affliction. You see that? So hopefully this helps. Garrett first and then and Jim. So there really is a comparison in 18. What it's saying is, and don't compare it, it's saying if you compare them, you have this huge eternal glory and this temporary suffering. Yes. They're not, they're not really to be equal to it. They're them. not at all. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's right. You are comparing. Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, you are comparing them, but realizing that, wow, relative to each other, you know, I got a question for you. I saw a real funny, we saw a real funny thing on, on, uh, on uh, YouTube or whatever. So this will be a crazy illustration. So there's this three or four year, year little boy, whatever. I don't know, what, how old was the guy? Little kid. Okay, you, yeah. So, so the dad, a, a small human, yes, yeah. Okay, way smaller than you and Rich, okay. The dad is sitting across the table from this little boy. And so the dad puts a pile of cash, $10,000, you remember now, right? $10,000 cash, and he tells his son, now son, this is, this is $10,000 here. This is a big, big stack of money, big stack, okay? And he said, that's $10,000. That's, you know. And then over here, he slides out two Oreo cookies. <laughs> and he, some of y'all, Sherry, you saw that one, some of y'all saw this one. And, and he, he, tell, he tells the, the son, okay, son, you can have whichever one of these you want, but just kind of take, take, and he had to calm the kid down as soon as he slid the Oreo cookies out, right? You know? And he tells him, just, you know, just kind of think about it. Which You got 10,000 bucks here, you got two Oreo cookies. And so which one do you want? And of course the kid is, he's, he's mad laser focused, right? <laughs> Them Oreo cookies, you know? And he kind of reaches out, and that's says, but, but wait, wait, I mean, come, you sure now? You know, you know, and of course the kid just give me those things. And the, the caption says, this is why you don't leave the various and the decisions about everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't leave them to kids. Now what happens is that in our life, we want the oil cookies. Yeah. Yeah. When God is, he doesn't have 10,000 on the table, he has a gazillion on the table. Yeah. So in that, you're right, in that sense, you don't compare the oil cookies with the gazillion, right? But wow. What, that was a great illustration, that little thing. I, I think, what's the guy that put that out? Uh, Drano, DC, no, it wasn't DC, Drano. It, the other guy, what it, yeah, so. But this should help us in terms of prayer, okay? Someone else had, okay, and, and, and then Robin, go ahead. Okay, uh, so going back to uh, Romans chapter five, we understand the way that God is operating during this dispensation of grace, and where it tells us that tribulation, work of patience, and patience, experience, experience, hope. When it says in five, that hope make it not a shame. Can you elaborate? Is that shame at the judgment seat, not understanding things properly? It is related to that, but when it's, look, everybody look at that verse, five, five. It, think of it this way, and hope maketh not a shame. It won't let you down. So often in the Old Testament, when God tells Israel about the foolishness of Israel turning to the gods of the Gentiles, He'll say it like this, that all the Gentiles that are trusting in their gods, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to find out their gods don't work. They don't help them. They're going to be let down. And so there's a real sense when the Apostle Paul says in hope, you know about the word hope in the Bible, it's confident expectation. God cannot lie. You can trust him. It's going to come to pass what he says. So hope, believe in God, it will not let you down. That, that's the sense there. Okay, Robin, go ahead. I can give you the idea what, what, and it's interesting because back to back when that happened with Joseph, the night before Joseph passed, we were there with Denise in the room and her kids. It, let me show you a passage, and it's in Romans 8. The way that I prayed was in relationship to strengthening the inner man, and get, get Romans 8 and get 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1 and Romans 8. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, it says, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all what? Do you see that there? When is it that we need comfort? 
if you ask Garrett, it's when uh, USC lost the game. USC, right? Yeah, when they lost their football game. Yeah, you're okay, okay, yeah. But when is it that we need to know God is the God of all comfort? It's when we're going through affliction. So they're going through affliction. So the prayer, one main aspect is, okay, God, you are the God of all comfort. And God, we pray, we ask that by your word that clearly is resident in, like Denise, in, like Debbie and so forth, and all that were there with her, God, by your word, if you would provide the strengthening, the comforting power of Scripture. By the way, that, that means you need to have the word in you, right? He says at verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Let me stop there for just a moment. Lori has, my wife has a, a dear, dear friend whose husband and home to be with the Lord was about seven or eight years ago now. At, uh, Moni, remember, and, and, uh, and uh, Lori, she said, you know, I'm going to call Jackie because Jackie ha has gone through that, that affliction. And I just want to ask Jackie what might she have as counsel to be able to share with like Denise and so forth. What were some of the main keys that she conveyed to you? Because they were really good. And you got to talk loud so everybody can hear you real quick. Well, just your presence, not your words. Um, especially if you're working with a believer, because they know the scriptures and they're there, but mostly just your presence and your care. And so you can be a, uh, maybe to be a listener, not a talker, right? And just, um, just little acts of kindness when I her, her sister-in-law was her biggest support, and she would just do things like, uh, you know, Jack work, had to go to work, but her sister-in-law would have dinner all her kids go on a week without home. They, she called every morning, said good morning, and every night said good night, um, because, you know, she didn't have anyone in the house anymore, most to say good morning and good night to. Yeah. Um, and praying with them. And, um, That's some and good counsel. Key right there, just to know they're not alone. And then if, if, if uh, so the God of all comfort, and then if you look over to Romans uh, 8, verse 11, so really the focus of the prayer was, God, we're asking you, our request to you now is to let us know you in your comforting capacity. And it's times like this, you kind of get thrown into the deep end. Okay, Lord, you got to help me swim. I need you to do that. I need you to be my, my, float, my floaty, whatever, okay, kind of a thing. And, and this, to me, is a real interesting verse to think about. Can your inner man have an impact on your outer man? Absolutely. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so look at this verse right here. It's at verse 11, Romans 8, 11. It says in Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and of course he does, yes? yes. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your which, your what? Your, your what body? What's that? That's your physical body. That's your outer man. And that verse says, shall quicken your mortal body, how? By his spirit that dwelleth in us. So one of the aspects of how to think about and pray for someone in physical affliction is, Lord, we know that your word works in the inner man. It strengthens the inner man. And as you strengthen that inner man, that actually can at least create an environment where the outer man is, not, is, is able to maybe recover more. It's not going to take the affliction away. That verse doesn't promise healing. But if, we can, if, we, if that person can be at peace in the affliction, that creates an environment where the outer man has got a better advantage to recover. And so that verse came to mind right there as, as we're praying for them. So these would be some kind of ways to think about. But in the end, what we want to do is we want God's word to work in us and them and that person. Someone recently said on one, of, I think it was one of the Zoom studies, maybe it was Wednesday or Thursday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, they said when you read all of Paul's epistles, 
90% of, of Paul's epistles, they are all prayers about the word working in us to give us understanding and then thereby to rest in God's word working in us. So these would be some examples. Does that clarify that? It's a great question that you're asking me. Really good, very good. Okay, great questions on prayers. On prayers. Thank you so much everyone for, for the t times like this are very important for all of us. You continue to pray please for, uh, for Debbie. I, many of y'all are going over there this afternoon to see her. We'll go over there again, see her. Continue to pray for Denise. A lot of decisions that both of them have to make and we'll, we'll make walking by faith in God's word. Let's unite our hearts. Oh, go ahead, Laura, I'm sorry, you say something? Can you say that loud for everybody again real quick? Uh, and Carla brought that up too. So yeah. No more pizza, right? <laughs> no more pizza, yeah. So. Amen. Very good. Yeah, so like, so they'll be, uh, Carl and Laura will be the point of contact for that. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Rich, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so Lori and Carla will be the point of contact really for both Denise and for Debbie in terms of maybe a care package, things like that. Um, probably especially with Debbie and Carla because you live there at the house with them, so she's got really direct connection with them as well. Okay. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time that we can spend this morning talking about how your word works in us and that it does work in us and what we can trust and should trust you to do in the midst of affliction and uh, sufferings, whatever they might be. And Father, we, we, we recognize that even though we live in the sufferings of this present time, that doesn't mean that every moment is a moment of suffering and sorrow. There are so many things to rejoice in, rejoice about, be grateful for. And so Father, help us to understand and see how that even though in, we live in the sufferings of this present time, we can walk by faith in the afflictions and yet we still, you beseech us, you instruct us, you encourage us to find joy in you in the midst of whatever the situation is. We well, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.